Thanks for downloading the second podcast by best-selling true crime author Gary C. King. Today's true crime podcast will cover the subject of bloodlust, portrait of a serial sex killer, Dayton Leroy Rogers. There will be a lot of information about the book, as well as never-before-told stories about how King was able to dissect the case and write this book. Be forewarned, some elements of this podcast are not for the faint at heart. Enjoy! Hello, this is true crime author Gary C. King again. I'd like to invite you at this time to join me on my website, truecrimeking.com, where you can connect with me on Facebook, Twitter, and other sites. Today we're going to talk about the writing and how Bloodlust, Portrait of a Serial Sex Killer, came about. It's kind of a lengthy story, but one that I think that you'll find interesting, especially the writers in the group. Bloodlust came about largely because of my brother, Don. He was 10 years older than myself and always a source of encouragement and enthusiasm for my work. When others were telling me that I should give up this nonsense and get a real job, Don was always pushing me forward. When I came up with the idea of writing the book, Don was there. I had already had an agent. i have been talking to Peter Miller for a couple of years. And I, of course, told Don about this along the way. Don suffered polio as a child. He never let his handicap become a handicap. And throughout his life, right up until the day he died, he always had an entrepreneurial spirit. And I believe I picked up a lot on that as I grew up and as I watched him. He was someone I looked up to, a role model. And it was largely because of him that I transitioned from writing magazine articles into writing books. Gary, why this case? What was going through your mind at the time to prompt you to write about this specifically? I had decided that I wanted to write a book. I needed to make the transition from writing magazine articles to books. And there was a case that had just finished up in Oregon at the time. It was about Dayton Leroy Rogers, Oregon's worst serial killer to date. He was a businessman, a family man, but also a serial killer. The case interested me immensely, so I decided that that was the case. Once I knew that that was going to be the material, I had to, first of all, find a publisher. And to the readers listening to this, I think you'll appreciate the fact that I really didn't have a clue on how to write a book, much less a book proposal, which I understood came first. So I landed on the case, decided I had to write a book proposal, and since I didn't know how to do it, I picked up a little book called How to Write a Book Proposal by Michael Larson. Great little book. I recommend it highly. It's still in print. And I studied it. I read it thoroughly a couple of times, and then I sat down and began writing the book proposal. I ended up with 160 pages, which is much too long, I was told later. That's beside the point. It was a 160-page book proposal, which I later used as my outline, and I sent it off to my agent, Peter Miller. He, in turn, sent it out to a dozen publishers. Uh, NAL slash Dutton, part of the Penguin USA group, picked it up. Michael Hamilton was my editor. So I spent the next six months working on it. How did you begin the process of writing Bloodlust? My editor at NAL Dutton liked the proposal, despite its length, and she told me to, in the future, to make my proposals about 10 pages long, 15 at the most. Nonetheless, I was able to use the proposal as a great outline. It helped guide me through the book. Now that I'd sold the book, got my book contract, I had to get down to work. I basically had six months to research and write the project. I began with the department in charge of the investigation of Dayton Leroy Rogers, Clackamas County Sheriff's Department, and was assured that I could get cooperation from them now that the case had been fully adjudicated. He'd been convicted and sentenced by the time that I approached them about it. Since they had worked with me several times in the past during my writing with magazines and had done several stories about cases that they had worked, I had a good relationship with them. One day during the summer of 1992, I met someone in a parking garage in downtown Portland. It's kind of like a scene out of All the President's Men where the reporters were talking to a source known as Deep Throat. I'm not going to name my source in this case. We basically met and I opened the trunk of my car in a darkened corner of the garage and this person opened their trunk of the car and we transferred about six boxes of case files from their car to my car and I kept them as long as I needed them. So I spent the next few months reading through them thoroughly, and I hadn't written a word yet other than the proposal. I had to get used to what I was dealing with, and believe me, it was not an easy feat. So I studied it for a while and decided I'd write it in my regular style of just the facts, ma'am, hard-hitting and to the point. No sugarcoating, 
as victims' families don't like that. No long eight-page descriptions of city streets, not trying to be the Margaret Mitchell of true crime. Crap like that is only filler and belongs in fiction, not true crime. The details were quite shocking even to me from what I read. I decided the thing had to be written in my style. Families of victims don't want the killer glamorized or romanticized like Ted Bundy was. They want the killer to remain the evil person, the monster that took their loved one, for readers to see them as they are, not some fantasy of a writer's imagination. And I'd found this out early on from talking with victims' families during the writing of detective stories. They wanted the truth. They don't want some sugar-coated version handed to them and the readers. They want a correct portrayal of what was done. There were elements of this case that hit really close to home. As I studied the case files, I came across the name of a, a girl that went missing that I went to high school with. It didn't really surprise me that she may or may not have become a victim of crime because of the lifestyle that she led in high school. Just seeing her, her name listed as a possible victim, a missing person who was being looked at in the Dayton Leroy Rogers case, kind of threw me for a loop. I never did find out whether or not she was related to the case other than as a missing person. There was nothing further in the case file to indicate that she had been victimized by Rogers. As the, the detectives would tell me later during interviews, they believed he had many more victims than were accounted for in the official records. Dayton Leroy Rogers was portrayed in the media as a husband, had a wife and a son, and a local businessman in the Woodburn Canby area who ran a small engine repair shop, and he was successful at it. It was enough to help support his family, and he was actually respected in the community. These are small communities, mind you. Did Dayton Leroy Rogers keep trophies of his victims? No one knew what lurked beneath the skin. Rogers had a very, very dark side that nobody really understood. I don't think even he understood it. This was a guy who carried a bag of women's jewelry underneath the seat of his Nissan pickup truck, which his wife found at one point, as the case was at its height when women were missing off of Portland streets, being picked up by an unknown man named Steve the Gambler, he called himself. Should have been a major red flag to his wife, but for some reason it wasn't. It was dismissed and not reported until later. Dayton Leroy Rogers had a history of violence toward young women, dated back to his youth in the 1970s. He was always slapped on the hands and he slipped through the cracks of the system, despite the fact that he stabbed one of his victims at an early age. He was known to pick up high school girls who were either skipping school or on their way to school and doing things with them that were not normal. Sexual things that we won't get into here, but the book supplies enough information. Tell us about Jenny Smith, Roger's last victim. I think I've gotten a little bit ahead of myself and should really start where the investigation began, and that is with the murder of Jenny Smith, a young mother who also worked as a prostitute. Dayton Leroy Rogers had picked her up, I think, on Union Avenue and Wygant Street in Portland and had driven her to a darkened area of a Denny's parking lot in Milwaukee, southeast of the city. It was early morning hours. Rogers bound her in the front seat of the pickup and started performing his sadistic acts upon her. At one point, he reached into the glove compartment and pulled out a Regency Sheffield kitchen knife that he always kept there. And this terrified Jenny. She was tired of being bitten and hurt by him already, and she saw the knife and started screaming. And she managed to break away from him, despite the fact that he had already cut her before she got out of the truck. And she stumbled out naked and bound into the parking lot, Rogers in pursuit with his knife. And Jenny is screaming at the top of her lungs, and this is all happening in front of dining patrons at Denny's. People inside see what's happening in the parking lot because Rogers chases her basically to an area from dark to light. He finishes her off. He stabs her to death right there in front of people. And one of the patrons, seeing this, jumps in his own pickup as Rogers is fleeing the scene and chases him. For a few miles down McLaughlin Boulevard, he gets close enough where he obtains the license number of Rogers' pickup truck, and he reports it to the authorities, and of course, because of jurisdictional issues, was transferred to the Clackamas County Sheriff's Department, which is their jurisdiction in this area. Did the police know what they were dealing with prior to this event? No, the police had no idea. They thought Jenny Smith's murder was isolated 
they investigated it as such at first. It took a couple of hours for things to work through the system. At one point that same morning, Detective John Turner got the call about the murder, and he ran the license plate number through the DMV records, and Dayton Leroy Rogers' name came up along with his address and his business address where he ran his small engine repair shop. Turner, in the early morning hours, drives to those addresses, finds out that Dayton's not at home, he's at the shop, goes to the shop, and Dayton meets him. He's kind of nervous. He tells Turner that uh, he's been there all night. Turner says, been here all night, huh? Turner feels the hood of the pickup truck, and it's warm. He raises the hood, and the engine is actually hot like it had been run hard. And at this point, he observes cut marks on Dayton's hands, possibly from the knife that killed Jenny as well, just from his hand slipping. He figures he's got his man. There are other factors that go into Turner's decision that he's got the right guy. But there's little doubt at this point, so he arrests Rogers and takes him to jail that morning. Tell us about how Dayton acted with Jenny Smith, as opposed to accounts with his other victims. Up until the morning when Dayton killed Jenny Smith, he'd been pretty careful. Police didn't even know that he existed yet. They knew women were disappearing off Portland streets, but they had no idea that Dayton Leroy Rogers was behind these disappearances yet. So Dayton's actions that night with Jenny Smith were more out of panic I believe, than anything else. He realized that she'd gotten away from him in a, in a semi-public place early at morning hours, and he couldn't let that happen. He had to get her out of the way because she could go to the police and identify him. Another thing that surprised Dayton that morning was he didn't think one of the diners at Denny's would actually chase him down and get his license number. Everett Banyard was a local hunter. He liked to go into the areas near the Malala Forest, do his hunting, and one particular day he was there and he stumbled across Dayton's dumping ground. Of course, the police didn't know yet that that was Dayton's dumping ground. Banyard found decomposed body, and uh, he didn't know what he was dealing with either, but he reported it to the police. And that was the beginning of the end for Dayton Leroy Rogers. Although he'd already been arrested for Jenny Smith, the police kind of worked backwards from that and uh, through a number of ways linked the murders in the Malala Forest. So when they went up there to investigate what Everett Banyard had found, they discovered not one, but several bodies. It was a remote, dark area of the forest, difficult to get to. They identified it as a crime scene and immediately recognized it as a cluster dump site for a serial killer. The victims were all female, and they spent days, if not weeks, up there investigating. One thing basically led to another. They found that uh, some of the victims, even though in a decomposed state, they were able to determine that they'd been tortured severely. Tell us about the name Steve the Gambler. Steve the Gambler was an alias being used by a man driving around Portland's Union Avenue in particular. It was also known as Prostitute Row in northeast Portland. He was driving around picking up women, and many of the women survived their encounters with him. Others weren't so lucky. These reports were coming in over time to the Portland Police Bureau and other jurisdictions basically as missing persons. When the police were investigating the missing persons reports, they interviewed a number of prostitutes, women who had had these encounters, and they identified Rogers as a man who was identifying himself as Steve the Gambler. He would get them drunk on homemade screwdrivers. He would buy these disposable plastic bottles of orange juice at convenience stores, and he always carried around a number of bottles of the airline type bottles of vodka and he would mix these himself. It was easier, I suppose, for him to work himself into the frenzy to do the things that he did. So these reports were on the investigators' minds about the vodka bottles and the orange juice containers. And one day in the Malala Forest, John Turner was up there with other members of the uh, Malala Forest Task Force, which included Jim Strovink and John Gillian. And he encountered a package of vodka bottles, Smirnoff vodka bottles, the, the cardboard wrapping that they were held in. It immediately rang a bell, and he said, My God, this is our guy. We've already got him in custody. It's Rogers. That's basically, in a nutshell, how they really got on to Rogers as the Malala Forest killer. Give us some details as to what Rogers would do to his victims. Well, the ones that didn't survive Rogers' violence, they were really the unlucky ones, and they died horrible, horrible deaths. Rogers basically liked to saw off victims' feet. He liked to elicit pain in any way that he could. One of the ways that he liked to elicit pain was to bite his victim's feet until they bleed. 
Other victims he would cut with a knife. He liked to cut their heels with a knife. Anything to inflict pain. He loved the pain. The evidence actually pointed to the fact that he would saw their feet off just above the ankle with a hacksaw. And the police believed or theorized that he did this while they were alive and conscious. Police believe he did this along with the biting to elicit as much more pain as he could from his victims. When the women would pass out or go into shock from all the pain, police said that he would then use his hands to break the partially sawed bone the rest of the way to elicit even more pain, to bring them temporarily out of shock. Very vicious, very vicious man. One victim that they found, the autopsy showed that, and this is probably going to be disturbing to some listeners, he inserted a machete into the victim's vagina and cut her from the vagina all the way up to the sternum. Basically, he just laid her torso open. And it was believed that he did these things mostly inside his pickup truck because when the police confiscated it and processed it for clues and tore up the floorboards and so forth, there was blood, layers upon layers of blood and blood spatter. They, they found blood everywhere in the truck, traces of it, even though he made attempts to clean it up. You can't clean stuff like that up. Police interviewed several survivors who told them basically the same stories over and over, that he liked to tie them up and torture them in various fashion. He rarely had sex with them in the traditional sense. He liked to uh, masturbate between their feet by holding their feet together. One woman told a detective during the, the interviewing process, she said, thank God he didn't fuck me. The cop was kind of stunned by the statement and asked why, and she went on to explain that Rogers was very large. His penis was 14 inches long, she estimated, and that having traditional sex with him would have been very painful. There were several instances during the the interviewing process where women described Rogers performing fellatio on himself, which required him to be a bit of a contortionist to be able to do that. He seemed to enjoy displaying that, that act in front of them. As the investigation continued, police learned that Rogers truly had a bizarre foot fetish, and it started at a young age. He was fascinated with his sister's shoes and was known to often use them for his sexual fantasies. During his jail time, it was also mentioned that he had homosexual tendencies. This has never been totally verified or proven. No one has come forward and claimed to have had a sexual relationship, a homosexual relationship with him, except for possibly one person. Who were Dayton Leroy Rogers' parents, their background, and his upbringing? Dayton's parents were religious zealots, basically, and they pounded religion into their children. I'm not going to talk about the religion itself, but they moved around a lot when the kids were small. They didn't have a lot of money. At one point, uh, the family moved into a chicken coop and resided there for a while. And it isn't really known if these things contributed to Dayton's aberrant behavior or not, but one can only theorize that it must have had some effect on him. Where does Dayton Leroy Rogers stand currently? After a lengthy trial, Dayton was convicted of several counts of aggravated murder and various other charges. He was sentenced to death. He appealed, and he was actually retried a number of times. The death sentences were thrown out several times. As of now, best as I've been able to determine, he's still serving out his time at Oregon State Penitentiary, but it doesn't appear that he's going to be put to death if anytime soon, if ever. I believe his latest death sentence from early this century was thrown out a few years ago, and I don't know if they're going to try and reinstate it or not. The police, however, they believed all along that he's responsible for more murders than that which he was convicted of. It's just a matter of people either coming forward with information or other bodies being found. As of this time, he hasn't been linked to any additional murders. The additional murders is basically a theory based on his behavior. The type of serial killer that he is don't don't just start and stop. They go on for a long time. Please talk to us about your first book signing for Bloodlust and the events that took place that day. The first book signing was held in Oregon City, not far from where Dayton lived. The book signing occurred at an Albertson's grocery store of all places. And I didn't really know what to expect. I just knew it was my first book signing. When I showed up at the Albertsons that afternoon, I was shocked. 
there were probably 150 to 200 people lined up throughout the store, outside the store, in fact, waiting to get in to have a book signed by me. When I first entered the store, I was greeted in a very hostile manner by a former relative of Dayton's who asked me why I had chosen to write such a book about him. The guy basically badgered me and badgered me until I threatened to get security on him, which I didn't have to. He left anyway. So I was shaken at that point, a little bit nervous, and I went ahead and walked over to the table. And first person in line was a woman and her daughter, and she identified herself as Dayton Leroy Rogers' former wife. So shock upon shock, here I am face to face with a former wife of his, but she was not at all hostile, and she was grateful that I'd written the book. I signed a couple copies for her, and and before she left, though, she wanted to make sure that I believed that she was really who she said she was. And she pulled out a wedding photo of her and Dayton. And sure enough, it was him in the photo along with her. I'd just like to end this podcast by saying that all of the details of Dayton Leroy Rogers' crimes are included in Bloodlust. And I wanted to make this podcast to give you a brief overview of what to expect when you read the book. It's not for the squeamish. It comes across strong. It's hard-hitting. There's little in it that's left to the imagination. Please join me on my website, truecrimeking.com. There's a vast amount of information there, information about all of my books, ways that you can connect with me on Facebook and Twitter. You can leave your email address for me for a mailing list. All of my books are available for purchase via my website. I'll be posting additional information on future podcasts on my website. The The next one will probably be about Driven to Kill, the story of Wesley Allen Dodd, a child killer that most people will never forget. Comments on this podcast and others are greatly appreciated. Please get involved. Stay tuned.